Hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to my Avi Offenses, and welcome back to our next webinar this week. So I'm glad we are back today. No technical issues; everything is working perfectly. If some of you, one of some of you, have been uh, here on Tuesday, you know that we had some issues, but today everything is perfect. So I'm glad to be back with. Vladimir Silva, you can see him right here. Hello, Vladimir, welcome back. I'm glad that we are going to discuss PGTA today. I know this is your favorite topic, I think, right? So thank yeah. you so much for joining and I'm really looking forward to this. How are you? How are you feeling today? Uh, I'm fine. Thank you, Caroline, for the for having me. Um, I wouldn't say that uh, PGTA is my favorite topic, but, it, but it's certainly something that I consider extremely important and a very sure. useful tool for uh, infertility treatment nowadays. So I'm very happy to talk about it. The, the presentation is actually quite simple, but we can exchange ideas at the end. So I'm very open for sure. to that's why we are here. So, of course, we will start with Vladimir's presentation, but afterwards there will be time for your questions. So don't hesitate. Anything that's on your mind you would like to ask, Vladimir is here for you. And let me just remind everyone that Vladimir Silva is the embryologist, but also founder and CEO of Procrear and Ferti Central Clinic in Portugal. And he's the, be the very, be very best person to, to discuss today's topic for sure. So uh, I do believe you will find it useful. So let's go ahead with our presentation. I think we are all ready, right? Yes. Um, Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, is, is it okay like this? So I don't need to do anything, right? Just no, you can just the change the slides. Exactly. Yeah, Everything exactly. is working. Thank okay. you so much. Uh, Thank you, Caroline. Well, um, hello, everyone, once again. Uh, my name is Vladimir Silva. I'm the CEO of FertiCentro and Procriar, two Portuguese IVF clinics, uh, FertiCentro in Porto, Pro uh, FertiCentro in Coimbra, Procriar in Porto. And so today's topic, like Caroline was saying, is about PGTA. Uh, this is the title. Is PGTA the key to your fertility journey? Exploring personalized strategies for diverse patient groups. Okay. Um, Moving on, um, the first question uh, is this. So uh, in the first slide, we had a question. Is PGTA the key to your fertility journey? Um, and, uh, and then the answer is kind of also in the title because it says exploring personalized strategies for diverse patient groups. So um, is, is uh, PGTA the answer? Uh, we really, we really don't know uh, because it depends. It depends on, on a lot of factors and we will address that uh, later during this presentation. But um, so let's start to say, uh, to talk about PGTA. What is PGTA? Well, uh, first of all, what's PGTA for? PGTA is the acronym for Preimplantation Genetic Testing for a Nucleides. What is this? This is about screening for genetic risks in the embryos, chromosomal abnormalities. Um, these are typically age-related, okay? So the first question that we will say, okay, this is age-related, but from what age does it make sense? And whether does it make sense to do er on an earlier age? Uh, why not? Uh, what are the criteria to do PGTA? We will address all of that during this presentation. So um, PGTA, for people that are on longer journeys to become parents, was formerly known as PGS. PGS was the acronym for pre-implantation genetic screening. Uh, so PGTA is a test that is performed on embryos to screen for numerical chromosomal abnormalities, what we call aneuploidies. So in practical terms, these are embryos with an extra or a missing chromosome. One of the most well-known aneuploidies uh, that exists is trisomy 21, where there is an extra chromosome 21. Uh, so the embryos with an extra or a missing chromosome, they often fail to implant. So we have negative results. Uh, they also lead to, to miscarriages or um, obviously some of these uh, abnormalities are compatible with life and they and so these pregnancies can lead to the birth of a child with a genetic condition. That's the case, for example, of, uh, of PGTA. Uh, embryos that can be found chromosomally normal are referred to as euploid. We, we call them euploid embryos and are the most likely to 
lead to a successful uh, pregnancy. At Ferti Centro and Procrear, uh, we do PGTA with next generation sequencing, which allows us to analyze all, to all of the 24 different chromosomes that exist in the human species. And we always do that on blastocysts, which, is day, which are day five or day six embryos. Um, so um, the, these chromosomal abnormalities are detected prior to embryo transfer. So what we do is this, we, that we do the extended culture of the embryos until day five or day six, when they get to the blastocyst stage, they have more than 100 cells. We do uh, a, uh, an embryo biopsy, which is basically a hole in the embryo uh, with a laser system, and then we collect some cells. These cells are uh, genetically analyzed. They are sent to a specialized genetics lab, uh, and the, the embryo is frozen. Uh, they are vitrified, and we will wait for the result to know whether the embryo is viable or not. So. A very important thing that uh, we should say is that PGTA is not about making embryos better. It's about giving us information uh, on, on the capacity to select the best embryos. What I always tell patients, doing PGTA will not increase your chances of becoming a parent, okay? If the embryos are not good, medicine, science doesn't have the capacity to transform bad embryos into good embryos, okay? So what this tells us is the truth. It certainly can help to reduce the number of cycles needed to obtain a pregnancy, because let's say if we do a cycle and all embryos are abnormal, it doesn't make sense to transfer those embryos. Or if we have, uh, for example, five embryos, four of them are genetically abnormal, so it we will only transfer the one that is viable. Okay, so in this case, this will reduce the number of embryo transfers, the number, the, the, the number of cycles um, needed to obtain a pregnancy, okay, but it will not increase the likelihood of having a pregnancy because unfortunately, uh, embryos uh, are made from eggs and sperm and eggs and sperm are made by humans. At the IVF clinics, we can put them together, we can create embryos, but we cannot change the genetic content of these embryos. Um, another important thing that I was mentioning before is, okay, PGTA, the type of chromosomal numerical abnormalities that we're talking about are essentially associated with female age, okay? Uh, but, um, but the most important question is, above what age, okay? So we all know that uh, female uh, fertility declines with age, uh, and that happens because the number of genetic abnormalities uh, increases with age. We will address that later in this presentation, but it is extremely important because that's one of the most relevant questions that patients ask us, and even IVF regulators, uh, they, they have rules on that uh, in most countries including in Portugal. So uh, here we have a graphic that I collected from the, the iGenomics website. This is based on a study, uh, on a study uh, by uh, Carmen Rubio uh, that was published in 2019 and that um, addresses the incidence of a nuploidis numerical uh, chromosomal abnormalities in blastocysts, day five or day six embryos, uh, according to, to maternal age. And we can see that the, it is more or less about uh, above the age of 39, where we have, roughly speaking, a 64% chance of an embryo to be chromosomally uh, abnormal, that it makes sense to test the embryos. This is actually what we do in Portugal. Um, we, the, the Portuguese regulator has set the age of 39 as the age above which we can, we don't need a special permit to do PGTA. Uh, before that age, we can only do PGTA in cases where we had at least three negative results after embryo transfer, not three IVF, three embryo transfers with negative results. A previously affected pregnancy, meaning a pregnancy where we had a, a, an abnorm uh, chromosomal abnormality, either diagnosed by PGTA or by prenatal uh, diagnosis, um, or if we had at least two miscarriages. Um, 
there are other situations, but these are the most uh, obvious ones. So, uh, and this is actually what makes sense because you can see that uh, below that age, meaning, for example, at 35, 37, or below 35, which is the age of the egg donors, uh, we don't get a lot uh, of. Um, of any applied is. Uh, and so if we need to, to establish a cutoff, I think 39 is a number that makes sense. Obviously, this is also a legal regulation, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. There is, there is uh, some, there are some people in the world and I don't disagree with them, uh, but in many places, uh, there are people that just say, it always makes sense to test the embryos because even if the chance of having a nuploid embryo is 1%, it will always be beneficial. It is, okay, but there are also uh, economic factors here, the cost of testing. Um, and so I would say that uh, setting the cutoff at 39 years old seems like a, a reasonable option. It's a sensible option and it is something that allows us to work and identify the most, uh, the cases that are most at risk due to advanced maternal age. Um, this is another graphic from my genomics here, and it, it is important to see that in the in the bluish gray bars we have the results of IVF with PGTA, and in the orange bars we have the results of IVF without PGTA. So what's the difference? The difference is that obviously in the bars with um, that are gray, let's call it, call this gray, uh, we have the um, the probability of pregnancy of the select embryos, the embryos that are considered to be normal, while in the orange we have all the embryos, the ones that are viable and the, the ones that are not viable, that were not possible to distinguish from, from the other ones because uh, we didn't do PGTA in the, in the orange cases. And we can see that, uh, for example, when we talk about implantation rates, there, are, there is not much of a difference of pregnancy, bet of pregnancy rates between age groups. This means that when we transfer embryos that, are, that have a normal chromosomal uh, constitution, uh, the probability of pregnancy stands more or less stable. There is a slight decline with age, okay? This is associated essentially with other factors like risks during pregnancy, the quality of the uterus, other risk factors that are age-related but are not uh, dependent on the quality of the embryos, okay? Uh, but we can see that the overall pregnancy rate declines. So it's possible to select embryos that are viable in all of these age groups and keep the, the pregnancy rate stable. The same happens with the delivery rates and the opposite happens obviously with miscarriage rates because we know that if an embryo is chromosomally abnormal uh, it is more likely to, to come down to, to, to miscarriage and obviously miscarriage rates increase with age. So the, the key here is obviously female age, okay? The reality is that we can't help that. Patients have whatever age they have, and it is a tendency worldwide. For example, there, is, there are a lot of information on this on the news in multiple countries. For example, in France, 5% of the babies are born uh, from mothers above the age of 40, and we, uh, in, in the United States, uh, the same in the UK, the same. So uh, it is something that happens everywhere in the world and it is a tendency of our days. For example, we can see here on this graph, these are data from France. We can see that in the, in the 1960s, um, so, so the tendency in the blue line, we have the number of babies born from mothers after the age of 40, okay? And we can see that there was a decline until the uh, until the 80s and from the 80s onwards there is a, a huge increase what happened here we can see that on the on the graphic on the right hand side because uh, as we can see here 76 percent of the babies born in 1967 for mothers above the age of 40 were their third or more baby, okay? Well, so well nowadays it is they are essentially uh, the first pregnancies. The number of first babies after the age of forty has increased. So this means that 
people here were having a lot of kids and so after their 40s they were still having kids but there it was essentially their third their fourth their fifth kid above the age of 40. obviously with the evolution of the modern society that went down uh, and then because people started to have babies later and later in life and then what happened in the 80s is that IVF started and we we started to have um, babies through IVF and then the 40 year old pregnancies uh, returned and they are increasing a lot it's a reality of our days and this is why PGTA has become uh, so important uh, because um, when we when we we take care of them uh, when we are um, trying to get pregnancies above the age of 40 we always need to be mindful of the chromosomal abnormalities risk uh, and this is something that we can never forget we can discuss a little bit of what happens for example there are obviously social reasons uh, there is there are some preconceived ideas in the society this is a very interesting graphic that i've found uh, for example uh, this is the age above which People consider uh, women um, uh, that a woman is too old to have more kids. For example, in Portugal, they consider that at 40, uh, women are considered too old to have too old to have more kids. But in France and the UK, for example, that value is 45. So people all have a, some misconceptions. Obviously, these are caused by education factors the type the the lifestyle that we all live that we all live and um, it is what it is we have to to deal with this um, another um, thing here uh, is the the level of education and we can see that uh, in in the more educated women are the um, the higher the mean age uh, at, um, at first childbirth, which is kind of intuitive as well. So what happens is that education of women, the development of the modern society, again, uh, increases the, the average age uh, of women when they have the first kid. And this obviously causes problems and, and gives us this concern. Uh, the same can be seen here. This is and there is a clear association between female employment and fertility rates. So the more uh, the higher the female employment rates um, uh, th this is actually interesting because uh, female employment rates uh, are um, so in a country such as Portugal uh, normally we say patients uh, patients no women have to work to to provide for their kids and so on but um, in some countries they are achieving success uh, in getting good fertility rates with good levels of female at work um, of women at work uh, but obviously this is also associated with immigration okay uh, there is some discussion on this topic um, i won't do a lot of um, I won't lose a lot of time talking about this. Uh, this is obvious. These are this is a, an evaluation on the social reasons behind uh, women's participation in labor force, women getting access to better education, uh, and the relationship between the income and um, uh, and, um, and and the number uh, and, and the, the the ability to to have kids later in life. So the the um, uh, so we have a, a social problem. Bottom line, and it is the most important take-home message. And this is something that won't go away. Actually, the tendency is towards increasing this factor because what we have seen in all countries is that the average the mean age and at in, at which woman, women have the, their first kid is increasing everywhere. Uh, this tendency is not stabilizing, it's always growing. And if the first child is already above the age of 30 in most countries, the second child is uh, typically two or three years later. And so um, this is why PGTA will become more and more uh, a reality for everyone because uh, it is a way to detect uh, 
beforehand uh, the risk of having an aneuploidy. And as we can see, as we could see in the first graphic, above certain a certain threshold, and I would put that threshold at the age of 39, uh, it is really there is really a very high chance of having a, a chromosomal abnormality. Uh, and so the tendency here is to do more and more PGTA with time. Um, but obviously, it still happens. There are a lot of women. These are examples of celebrities who had their, uh, who had kids after the age of forty. We can see here Uma, Th Uma Thurman, Mariah Carey, Meryl Streep, Nicole Kidman, Brooke Shields, Selma Hayek, Gina Davis, Susan Sarandon, Celine Dion, Halle Berry, Kim Basinger, Gwen Stefani. I mean, all of that, all of these women that are women like other, like all others had kids um, after the age of 40 and obviously some of them were used egg donation that it, that doesn't come on the uh, on social media and uh, in the magazines that announced this but uh, a lot of them had to go through IVF and obviously for uh, for these cases it is very important to um, to assess the, the the associated genetic risk. Once again, why do we have that? This is what nature gives us, okay? This is a graphic on the probability of conception and the risk of miscarriage, uh, uh, the association between that and female age, and uh, in, na in a natural pregnancy context. So this is not a graphic about IVF. And we can see that the probability of a pregnancy is relatively low in humans, sorry. Uh, it's about 25%, and above the age of 35, it starts going down. Okay, and it goes down and down until it reaches menopause. And why does it happen? Because the risk of miscarriage increases a lot. And why do we have that risk of miscarriage? We have this on the next graphic. Because the percentage of euploid, meaning uh, eggs um, with, um, so in this case, these are embryos, embryos with a normal constitution goes down and very down with age. And in this graphic on the right-hand side, the probability of retrieving at least one euploid embryo, meaning one embryo with a normal genetic constitution, also goes a lot down with age. And it goes especially uh, fast, uh, and it drops especially fast above the age of 35. You can see that here we have kind of a stable situation. And then after the age of 35, there is a significant drop in the number in the probability of having at least one viable uh, embryo. The same happens on the left hand side with a percentage of euploid embryos. So this all goes. So this is another way to look at it. For example, uh, this is a clear association between eggs. Before we were talking about embryos, this uh, this is the association between eggs. Uh, um, abnormal eggs and female age. Again, the problem starts at 35. Uh, and this is the risk, uh, the probability of live birth. It starts going down also, uh, especially above the age of 35. And the risk of miscarriage also spikes uh, above the age of 35. And also another interesting thing here uh, on this right-hand graphic is the probability of having a trisomy, like trisomy 21, trisomy uh, 20, uh, 18, or trisomy 13. We can see that it really increases with age. And in these balloons, we can see the average, uh, the mean age uh, of women at the birth birth of their first child. We could see that, that in the 70s, and they were here at the age of 26, so less than 5% risk of trisomy. But with the increase in the mean age for women to have their first child, we are also climbing this ladder of the risk of having a trisomy. And obviously, we know that if we reach these values here, and, uh, and the tendency is that this will eventually happen, uh, we will probably need more and more uh, PGTA and other methods or, or because we can't change nature, okay, but we can understand what is happening and it is the, the most important for, for patients. Uh, the same thing uh, in numbers, we could see that um, the risk of trisomy 21 at 10 weeks of pregnancy goes from 
one in 1,000 at the age 25 to one in 19 at the age 45. So this is a very significant increase. And this is something that uh, we all need to be mindful because uh, at the end of the day, what we all want uh, is to, to, to give our patients the, po uh, the possibility of having an healthy child. And uh, this is why we have techniques such as PGTA. This will not change the probability of a pregnancy. This will help us to understand what is happening in, ca in case of a negative result. This helps to identify the embryos that are at risk, especially for patients that are uh, at ages at risk, and it helps us to think. Okay, we sometimes we are hesitating between going through egg donation, between trying again with the patient's eggs, uh, on why are we having negative results, and uh, is this the embryo or the uterus? Does it make sense to do tests like uh, immunitary tests, like, for example, the gear antigens, the thrombophilia, other immunity factors that uh, we test, uh, interlipids? I mean, there is a world of, uh, of tests that are done everywhere in the world uh, and sometimes we're doing those tests but in reality what we don't know is that we were transferring embryos that were not uh, normal. Obviously we can never forget that uh, this is not just about the women, uh, so there are also a nucleides, meaning genetic abnormalities that have um, chromosomal abnormalities that have a male cause those are less likely to happen, but they can happen as well. And here we're only talking about things uh, that happen between two healthy persons and two, not healthy, at least two persons with a normal uh, chromosomal constitution, with a normal karyotype. There are patients, there are persons who are carriers of karyotype abnormalities, like uh, balanced translocations, like inversions of the chromosome that can cause uh, problems in the formation of their eggs and sperm. And in those cases, we'll also have uh, chromosomal abnormalities, but it's not the same, okay? Because here we're talking about problems that are random. This is why we call this a screening, not, um, not an actual diagnosis test directed for, for, uh, for specific patients. This is, so this is a screening that makes sense above a certain age. And the, the answer to the question um, that we are asking here is above the age of 39, including 39. Below that, in special patient groups, when there is a, a history of at least two miscarriages or three failed attempts, that's where when it also makes sense. Uh, knowing that, we could do it always because uh, there could always be a, some benefit despite sometimes the cost uh, my, the, the cost might be considered to outweigh the risks. And that's it. This is what I had to tell you. I believe this is more of a, a debate. This is a picture of our team in Coimbra. And uh, I'm very happy to answer all of your questions. So please feel free to ask me everything. Brilliant, as always. Thank you so much, uh, Vladimir, for your introduction to the topic and your explanation of how it works and who can benefit from PGTA. And now, your favorite time for sure, um, now it's time for your questions. So there are some questions already, but if you have any other questions, go ahead, type those in, and I'm sure it's going to be an interesting session already. Thank so uh, let's have a look at the first question from Carla. I have a history of recurrent pregnancy loss and it's been a tough journey for my husband and me. Can you discuss the role of PGTA in preventing miscarriages and improving the chances of a successful pregnancy for patients like us? I am 39, my husband is 41. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks for your question, Carla. Um, so uh, again, uh, PGTA will not improve the chances of a pregnancy, okay? Uh, it will tell us whether Carlos embryos are viable or not, okay? Um, recurrent pregnancy loss uh, is, um, 
is one of the most terrible problems that we face in because patients have the happiness of getting a positive result after doing uh, for example an IVF treatment uh, or and then uh, when there is this loss, this can be extremely hard from an, an, emotion, an emotional standpoint. Um, but uh, definitely, if if it is a recurrent pregnancy loss <coughs> case, but also because Carla is already 39, so she fulfills two criteria for PGTA. First of all, the age of 39. Uh, second of all, the diagnosis of recurrent pregnancy loss. Okay? If she had a recurrent pregnancy loss at the age of 36, my answer would be the same. She, she would still have an indication to the PGTA. What are the benefits of PGTA in this case? Well, first of all, this could help us to um, to target the, the type of the diagnosis and the course of the medical course of action. Because let's say Carla wants to try again. We can create the embryos and we will assess their chromosomal content. First of all, we can we can do um, uh, normally what we tell patients is this. Let's target a number of embryos that make sense. Okay. Typically uh, and there are statistics uh, about that. Uh, at the age of 39, we know that, statistically speaking, we would need between 15 and 20 embryos to have one viable embryo, okay? Um, statistics are not uh, very much on our side. Uh, not to have one viable embryo, to have uh, an ongoing pregnancy. Um, this is so normally in a patient such as Carla, we obviously need to balance between the ovarian reserve and the ability to do uh, new stimulations. Try to get to a compromise. I would say 10 embryos could be could look like a, uh, could be could could look like an interesting number, um, and or at least a number that allows us uh, to to work. Uh, sorry. 10 or sites, uh, and then typically we would get 40% of them are blastocysts from these four blastocysts or three or four blastocysts that we would get. Um, we would uh, hope that one, at least one of them is viable. So what uh, my suggestion here would be, first of all, to define a number of eggs that makes sense then do the necessary number of treatments to achieve that number of eggs, then try to get as many blastocysts as possible, and then test these embryos. If we get a genetically or chromosomally normal embryos, then I would say let's keep them frozen and let's study in the endometrium and see if there are any factors. For example, microbiota is a is a um, a very important aspect because it's linked with the risk of uh, of having a chronic endometritis for example immune factors like uh, uh, antigens cure uh, uh, H HLAC um, the for example uh, thrombophilia for example, uh, factors uh, associated with the integrity of the of the uterine cavity. So there are uh, lots of aspects that can be assessed and maybe optimized before we transfer these precious embryos. On the other hand, if we do and if we have a lot of eggs and a lot of embryos and they are all abnormal, then it might make sense for Carla and her husband to consider egg donation. Okay, uh, so this would help them either to uh, to have a better diagnosis and preparation process, or to maybe think uh, about changing the strategy. Uh, it's obviously uh, different when there is also obviously a, a very emotional part of the decision uh, moving to egg donation or not but uh, but so pgta is a very useful tool for patients in this situation okay so i would definitely recommend pgta in this case okay
Thank you so much for your thorough answer indeed. So I do believe it was helpful if, there's a, if there are any follow-ups, you know what to do. And now let's move on to the next question here. Uh, so how, how accurate is PGTA on embryos, mosaic embryos that de can develop, right, into healthy babies yeah. as well? Uh, this is one of, uh, it's, it's a very important question, just to explain to the public. Mosaic embryos are embryos with more than one cell line. So we have a, typically a, a normal cell line with a normal chromosomal constitution and another cell line that uh, has an abnormal constitution. So. Nowadays, uh, the tendency, uh, and because recent studies have shown that when the mosaic percentage is uh, below 50%, the probability of implantation for, of these embryos are the same as 100% euploid embryos. Why is that? Because typically the normal cell line overlaps the, the abnormal cell line. Okay, it's more viable, the, the normal cells are more viable than the abnormal ones, and so they typically take over. Uh, it, it also depends on how the report is done. Uh, nowadays, uh, the main genetic labs worldwide, they use artificial intelligence uh, techniques to understand, uh, to help uh, decide what are the embryos, the mosaic embryos that are more likely to develop into normal ones and, and what are not. And so in many cases, they only classify the embryos as good to transfer and bad to transfer according to those, uh, to, to what they see. But um, this is an ongoing debate, okay? The tendency nowadays, I'm from the time when I started working on this mosaic embryos, initially they were, it, the tendency was to exclude them. Then we started to allow them until 30% mosaic. Nowadays, uh, a lot of people consider that mosaic embryos should be uh, allowed at least to 50%. And this is actually what I believe. We've had a lot of embryos, a lot of babies born from mosaic embryos. Nowadays, uh, we let the genetics lab decide whether these embryos should be considered to be normal or not, and we follow their indications. Because in the IVF clinics, we really, uh, what we can do is obviously we can create the embryos, do the biopsies, send them to the genetics lab, but we are not in a position where we can really evaluate uh, the, the specific, the risk for every specific embryo. So where we are at this moment, and uh, and in principle, if the genetic lab advises advises us to transfer the mo a mosaic embryo, we will do it. And I think that's where the whole world is going in this aspect. All right. Thank you again for this answer. And more questions are coming in. This is the next one. So, do you recommend to include PGTA in the IVF for all patients? to increase the pregnancy rate. So uh, again, this will not increase the pregnancy rate. This will help us to, uh, to do a better embryo selection. And obviously, if we only transfer the, bet the best embryos, the pregnancy rate will rise. But it's an artificial rise. It's a mathematic manipulation, OK? Uh, so um, personally, I'm in favor of PGTA. So I'm a big fan of PGTA, and um, and uh, obviously we have to be mindful of the cost, of the risk of harming the embryo. At our clinics, we have uh, a very qualified team. People are very experienced doing um, doing PGTA, and so the risk is extremely low. The risk of losing an embryo with a biopsy is extremely low, but. This is obviously a risk that uh, no one can say that it doesn't exist. Uh, but, and so we also have to be mindful of that. There is also some additional manipulation because we're freezing and warming the embryos. And so there could be a 1 or 2% embryo loss due to this additional vitrification. Um, and so it is a balance between these risks and the benefits and obviously the financial burden that it carries. Um, so if we look into just what happens in the lab, 
okay, regardless of the costs and so on, I would be in favor of testing all embryos. Um, this is not legally possible because there are rules of access to this technique, at least in Portugal. Uh, in some countries, there aren't. Uh, but um, but so but this is not about increasing the pregnancy rate, but essentially about having more information. Okay, that's the most important uh, the most important point. All right. Brilliant. Okay. Again, thank you okay. so much. Two more questions are here. So what is the alternative to PGTA? Could the AI for amber selection, could it be a, a solution? Well, um, uh, I hope so. OK, uh, we are actually working with uh, IMA from IVF, which is one of the most recent artificial intelligence uh, artificial intelligence systems that has been launched recently. Uh, we were um, we were we were we are very proud to because we were part of the clinics that were used to develop this system, um, and we we've been working with the, the AIVF team for. Uh, for almost three years now, and um, and the, the reality is that what, how does this work? Uh, we have uh, the embryoscope. The embryoscope is an incubator with a built-in video camera that allows us to control the, the embryos 24, uh, 24 hours in a continuous way. Okay, 24-7, we have the embryos always under surveillance. And then uh, we can see how the embryos divide, how the cells um, develop, uh, and we, we see a lot of events happening in the embryos that we don't know what it means, okay? So uh, science is only developed until a certain level. This is a new field of science. And then on top of that, there are things that the human eye can, cannot see. So what these uh, artificial intelligence companies are doing is that they are reviewing the images of thousands and thousands of embryos, and they are comparing these images to the outcome. So if this embryo, for example, has given, uh, there, there was a live birth from this embryo, they know that this embryo should be good. If there was no live birth from this embryo, then this embryo is considered to be bad. And based on this, with thousands and thousands of embryos from all over the world uh, and also the capacity to learn because the system not only uh, associate, makes associations between things that happen in the embryos that we cannot see, we as humans cannot see, um, but they also the system also learns because every time there is a new pregnancy, the system goes and sees, so this and this and this that happened in this embryo is good, this and this and that that happened in that other embryo is bad. And so the system is always evolving. And, uh, and the system is also specific for every clinic because there are particularities on the culture system, on the incubating conditions and so on in every clinic uh, that uh, so we cannot pick the algorithm from my clinic and go to another clinic and just use it. No, the system has to learn to what happens, uh, to learn from what happens to the embryos at that clinic in order to develop a good algorithm. So having said this, there are a lot of work being done uh, comparing the results of PGTA and the results of the evaluation of the embryo development images from these algorithms. And the fact, the reality is that they are getting very close, okay? We're not there yet. Uh, I personally believe that uh, there is a good chance that this can happen, okay? It is, uh, there is a good tendency in this direction. We're still in the early days of artificial intelligence, but we have seen in every sector of our society how powerful it can be. And the same is happening uh, here in evaluating the embryos. So my guess would be that maybe in four or five years, we could be having very uh, results that are close to the ones obtained with the PGTA, which would be wonderful because we would not be touching the embryos. It would be just uh, evaluating about evaluating the images in a way that humans can do. So the human eye has its limitations. We can only process a certain number of informations. And so looking at everything many times, all the time, is something that can only be done by a machine. So 
maybe in the future, not yet, but I believe it will happen. Uh, that moment will arrive. Sounds promising for sure. And now we'll go to the next question. This is actually similar, right? So since there is AI for embryo selection, what's the advantage that PGTA tests can add in terms of embryo selection? Um, well, PGTA is always um, the, it's a direct assessment of cro the chromosomal quality of the embryos, okay? So uh, AI will always be about images, images um, at least AI for embryo selection. Uh, and PGTA is about directly testing the embryos. So the results of, uh, so the results of AI will always be indirect uh, while the, the PGTA results are direct, are, come from a direct evaluation of the embryos. So I would say, again, what I was saying, uh, I believe that in the future, AI can get close to what uh, PGTA is giving us right now. I think we're not there yet. I think it will come very close with time, but I don't know if, um, if, I, if uh, my guess is that PGTA will always perform better in terms of embryo evaluation than AI because it's it's the most direct method. Uh, AI is based in algorithms that are dependent on multiple factors. Um, so, but this is guessing, okay? This is a personal opinion. Mm -hmm. This is not based on, um, on information that we can rely on. Uh, this is me guessing the future. So my <laughs> guess is it will come close, but it will never be as good as PGTA. But okay. maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> maybe in 2030, we yeah. will be doing a webinar here. <laughs> you never know. Caroline, do you remember seven years ago <laughs> yeah. how wrong I was? But yeah, I you never know. But um, yeah, we just need um, to wait and then see. That's, that's how it works, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, possibly our final question. So if you have more, you know what to do. This will be the final call for those questions. And the question is really short. How much is the PGTA test? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so I can only give the price at our clinics, obviously. Um, so uh, we charge 790 euros for the embryo bio which is making the hole in the embryo with the laser system, and then 360 euro, euros for testing each embryo. Obviously, we need to add the cost of the IVF cycle on top of that. Uh, in Portugal, it costs around 4,950 euros, plus 500 euros for medication or so. Uh, it's... Uh, it's not cheap, okay? It's uh, it's a lot of money, and um, and the problem is that, uh, like everything else in IVF, the results are not guaranteed, and there is a risk that we spend all of this money and we end up with nothing. What I always tell patients is this: uh, when we need, when we want to have a baby, and uh, and the reality is that this is a a process that we have to go through. Um, it, it, I, I'm a person that prefers to have all the information, okay? And so it, sometimes, uh, even if the information is not favorable, it's preferable to know than to not know. I remember a case uh, from a few years ago where we had 10 blastocysts. It was an egg donation case. So in theory, there was no reason to do PGTA. Uh, and we started, um, I mean, it wasn't 10, it was 12, uh, 12 embryos, exactly. And we, we started doing PGTA. Uh, we started doing embryo transfers and we did four single embryo transfers and all of them became negative. And so we asked for a special permission to the Portuguese IVF authority. They allowed us to do PGTA to the remaining eight blastocysts. And from those eight, we only had uh, two embryos that were genetically normal. We transferred one of them and the patient immediately got pregnant. So it was, and to be honest, from a simple morphological evaluation, I wouldn't have selected that embryo. Uh, so we would probably have 
three, another three or four negative results before we we had the first positive. Uh, so PGTA saves time. In this case, it also saved money. Okay, uh, and and uh, and it was very important uh, for these patients to know uh, because this was a normal egg donor. I don't remember the details, but the results were theoretically very, very good with a lot of blastocysts. But the reality is that we ended up not having um, a lot of viable embryos, which is something that can happen. So we cannot control nature. We cannot control the quality of the, the eggs and the sperm. But uh, we can use the tools that we have at our disposition to know uh, the content. Um, there is also one thing that uh, we haven't discussed since we, I think we have a little time. Um, there is also one thing that is important to mention. PGTA is associated with a lot of ethical discussions. Uh, for some people, for religious uh, and political beliefs, uh, PGTA is about uh, testing the embryos. There are countries, for example, in France, PGTA is not allowed, uh, which is amazing how a modern and evolved country as France can forbid something like PGTA. But um, it, it's, it's more about a, con a more conservative mentality uh, and some ethical concerns. I think we are beyond that because what we do Every clinic, including in France, uh, in every genetics, in every IVF lab, we are obviously throwing embryos away because they are not viable. So we are throwing embryos away based in our impression, in the classification that we uh, do to those embryos based on the human eye, on sometimes not so objective criteria. While with PGTA, we have very objective criteria and we have serious reasons to either accept or exclude an embryo from the culture. So uh, rejecting PGTA is like rejecting science. Uh, it, it's not respecting the evolution of knowledge and, uh, and taking away from infertile couples the possibility to have very relevant information for their reproductive future. So I think it is all of these ethical barriers to PGTA are absolutely not justified. And in my opinion, they are actually unethical. <laughs> okay, so while they were trying to be ethical, they were they are actually doing the opposite and they are creating barriers to uh, to patients and they are forcing patients to go through a lot of it. For example, I can give you another example. On Monday, I was talking to a patient of ours. She had the baby, but she before she came to our clinic, she had 32 attempts. Okay, it's an amazing number. She never did PGTA. So we don't know what happened, mm -hmm. uh, nor the clinics. Obviously, she was doing uh, this on countries where PGTA is not allowed. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's incredible how this patient was submitted to so many procedures. And, um, and I would guess that maybe most of them, if not all of them, were pointless because she mm -hmm. was not transferring viable embryos. So PGTA would have saved her a lot of, it's not, uh, I mean, it's not about the treatment sometimes, it's about the emotional burden, obviously the financial burden and so on. Uh, so this is something that I, I really recommend and I think it should be allowed to, to more types of patients or at least in a evidence-based approach to patients above the age of 39 including 39. Thank you so much indeed for your answers. And I believe that that was our final question. But remember that uh, if you wish to get some more details from Vladimir or his team at FertiCent or Procreare, I'm sure they will be happy to help you out with any of those. So thank you everyone for joining. Vladimir, it's been a pleasure to have you here and thank you for your thorough um, explanation to every single um, question indeed and of course for presentation. And Sarah. I also want to add that Vladimir Siva will be back next week on Thursday. We will talk about embryo selection and creation. So if you mm -hmm. wish to join and find out a bit more as well on this, join us 
we will be back uh, actually on uh, 19th of October next week, um, Thursday. So I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you, everyone. Um, Vladimiro, it's always a pleasure to have you. I know we will see each other next week, so I'm already yeah. looking forward to this. Yeah, thank you. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take and care, good everyone. good luck to everyone that is Definitely. Like the baby. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye.